Recording is about to start. Good, that's a good start. Excellent. And do the share screen, the usual thing. And why is it not charging? Oh, well, I'm sure it will be charging at one point. If you didn't do the attendance for the test, I I, uh, I don't understand exactly the, the question, Daria. I mean, if you do the test, uh, then my understanding is that you attend it and therefore we would have a record uh, of you attending. Yeah, that's that's sort of my uh, that's 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 my assumption. But you you see, what do I know about these things? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there are a few things that I don't understand either. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, actually, I would not worry too much about these things. That's uh, you know, don't 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 stress. If you do the test, if you do well in the test, and from my point of view, my part, the ten uh, questions about enzymes, I think they are doable. Uh, then I think you 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 don't need to worry about stuff. Yeah, that, uh, that, that could very well be, Bernardo, that could very well be. I think uh, you will be pleased to hear, Daria, I think there is a question about Vmax in it. Just to please you. <laughs> Determination drive metabol metabolic pathways. Yeah, it's a sort of. Oh, good. <laughs> the magic of friendship. Our friendship is, uh, is really important, isn't it? Okay, shall we make a start? So, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this session. Um, um, in which I want to discuss with you what drives a metabolic pathway. Why, why does the metabolic pathway actually uh, happen? And uh, please don't forget to uh, register on Moodle and Bernardo has kindly provided the link already. So thank you very much, Bernardo. That's uh, very much appreciated. And again, thank you very much. Uh, good man, really good man. <clears throat> so why does a metabolic pathway happen? And by the way, what do we mean by metabolic pathway? Uh, let's try to uh, define that first a little bit. And um, what we basically have is uh, we have two different ways uh, of doing biochemical reactions. One is we use a high energy compound, high energy compound. And absolutely, absolutely. This high energy compound, for example, glucose, is then converted. Um, why does it go up like that? This is converted into a low energy compound.
And obviously, we get some energy out of it. So plus energy. So this is one way, and this is actually called a catabolic, catabolic uh, pathway, not a diabolic, that's something different. This is catabolism, high energy into low energy and we gain energy. But we can also do the opposite direction where we use a low energy compound, we need to invest some energy, and that gives us then a high energy compound, and that is called an anabolic process. So that's an anabolic process from low energy to high energy, and the reverse one, high energy to low energy, that is a catabolic process. And together, both of these together, this is metabolic. So when we talk about metabolic pathways, then we mean it could be either catabolic or anabolic, but not diabolic. So what drives a pathway? Now, last uh, lecture on Wednesday, I showed you how we can actually um, sort of liken metabolic pathways to these uh, electronic circuits. And uh, the most important thing that I want you to get from that lecture on Wednesday was this switch-like behavior when you have this phenomenon of ultra, a zero order ultra sensitivity. That's really an important uh, element in loads and loads of uh, pathways that lead to the regulation of metabolic, pa metabolic pathways. And in fact, I cannot think of a single metabolic pathway either catabolic or anabolic, that is not regulated in one shape or form. Every single metabolic pathway is highly regulated. So that's quite an important uh, uh, thing to bear in mind. I showed you that uh, in order for, uh, that we can, compare these metabolic pathways to electronic circuits. But we can also extend this a little bit to really to rivers, if you like. Metabolic pathways are really pretty much like a, a river. We have a source that would be, for example, a high energy compound, if it is a catabolic pathway, and then we have a sink. And uh, the, the path of that river would go from basically from the hills to, uh, to, to the sea. And, 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 and. Oof, that was interesting. Thank you. And now we are all awake. Um, anyway, and uh, I, in an uh, analogous uh, model again, we talk about uh, the flow of water in a river and the same holds true for the flux through uh, a pathway. And that is exactly the same thing. Flow actually is in Latin is flux. And if we are thinking about the flow of a river, it's uh, pretty much the same as the pathway. We also can control the flow control the flow or the flux through the pathway through different enzymes, control the flux by enzymes, by the different reactions, and how much each enzyme actually contributes uh, to this regulation 
That is a value that is called the flux control. Flux control. This basically tells us how much an enzyme actually contributes uh, to the overall flow of this metabolic pathway. So flux control, and each enzyme has a has different sort of flux control, what is called flux control coefficients. And they tell us actually how the enzyme fits in with this steady state that we discussed. And we will discuss steady state more today. So each enzyme has these flux control coefficients, how much they actually contribute to the steady state. So that is what these uh, flux control coefficients tell us. I'm not going to uh, discuss that any further. If you are really interested in that, there is a whole discipline uh, within biochemistry, which is called MCA, which stands for metabolic control analysis. I personally find that absolutely fascinating. Um, it is a fairly, you know, it's not new, the system. Uh, it was really uh, developed in the 1960s and 70s, and it's now has been expanded by uh, something that is called systems biology. Systems biology, which again is an incredibly interesting topic. Um, and we we learn so much about uh, how biology, how life actually works with this systems biology. So that's a totally fascinating thing. So what drives a reaction now? Or what drives a whole pathway? And the answer is it is a difference in energy. And I alluded to that earlier. When we talk about metabolism, we have high energy compounds. And um, we convert the high energy, so that would be a high energy compound, high energy compound, and we convert that into a low energy compound here. And we get chemical energy. Um, out of it, and this is usually abbreviated with delta G. And you, um, you actually have encountered that in the BI3220 module. Am I right? Is this correct? That you have done that, delta G? Brilliant. Excellent. And I mean, if you, if you have this analogy, But then it would be optional only for people who have done A-level chemistry. Uh -huh. Hmm. Okay, let's let's try to be uh, as gentle as I can with this delta G, with this uh, stuff, with this energy stuff, uh, because obviously it is a really an Im important uh, concept. Now, we can liken that basically to sort of the difference in um, with potential energy when we have a water and a sort of a water wheel like this one here. So the water flows in that direction and then goes down and drives this wheel. Uh, 
Uh, don't ask me who is doing what. I lost uh, a long time. I lost the, uh, the, uh, the, the grip on that. So please don't ask me who is, is doing that. So for a pathway to happen, it always follows, or at least for, uh, for a um, catabolic pathway to happen, it flows from high energy to low energy. And um, what we gain from that is this delta G. And the way we always calculate delta G is the energy level, energy level after the event minus the energy level before the event. That's always how we compare these things. It's always after minus before, right? Now, what would be our delta G if we look at this scheme here, so we have high energy level before we go through the pathway and a low energy compound after we went through the pathway. So delta G, would this be positive, negative or zero? Absolutely right. It would, it has to be a negative value. So delta G would be negative, would be smaller than zero because we have a low energy compound. That's the after minus a high energy compound. And uh, we are not worrying too much about this delta G, delta H, T, delta S. Uh, at, the, at the moment, we are just looking at the general delta G. So I'm not going to discuss this delta G, uh, all these uh, other things. Thank you. Uh, because for me, the important thing is just this delta G for the time being. So that people who are uh, not familiar with delta G, that uh, they can catch up. Okay, so in order for this pathway actually to happen, delta G is negative because the high energy compound uh, it has, has a higher energy as the low energy compound. So pretty, pretty straightforward, I guess. So now we have something like that. Oof. So, can we look at this pathway and determine what is the energy level that we get from that? What would be our delta G in this case? Obviously, our delta G in this case would be from here, basically, to here. Now, that would be here, our delta G. And it is still negative because this one here has the, this D has the lower energy as the A. But what you see is it has, the delta G is not as negative as in the previous one here. Here the delta G was much larger, whereas here the delta G is smaller. And what actually happens is that we have one step here from C to D where we are sort of going uphill again. But overall, 
it is still negative and we would flow in this direction from A to D. So that would be our flow. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it's pretty simple. What about this case? What is our delta G? They should be on the same level. Yeah, if they are the same, and I, 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 I thought I drew it like they are the same, our delta G, let me indicate it like that, delta G is pretty much zero. So how much energy, D is slightly lower, uh, actually, I'm not entirely sure, according to PowerPoint, it's the same level. So, so how much energy would we get out of this pathway if it was like that? Would we get any energy out of it? You're absolutely right. We wouldn't get any energy out of it. Uh, but still the pathway could go in this direction, right? Or it could go also in the opposite direction. So this pathway can go either way. It is not driven by the energy. And if we've got a case like that, then the pathway, people say the pathway is sort of, um, well, it's almost like, we are we are in an equilibrium. Nothing happens really. The pathway uh, can't do any energy, so it's also pretty much very much reversible. The whole thing, very much reversible. The pathway. No, you don't get B and C because the energy that you gain from B and C, the movement, you have to invest again in moving C up to D. So therefore, you do not gain any energy here because all you need to do is compare the starting level with the end level, right? But it's a good way of thinking. What about this pathway? What is delta G? Absolutely right. Delta G here is this one here, and therefore delta G is positive, is larger than zero. So that means our pathway would not move from A to D. A to D, the pathway actually would move from D to A. Because only from D to A, if we're moving in that direction, our delta G would be negative. And the pathway is always driven by delta G being negative. Does that make sense? Are you happy with that? Great. Good. So what we need to look at is a few definitions, and I've uh, written them out because uh, that uh, to 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 save some time. Uh, again, I will put up these slides and the lecture scribbles on the uh, class materials on Teams so that you don't have to take screenshots, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So 
if we, let's say, we have this reaction A plus B is converted into C plus D, if we just look at it like that at a closed system, so this system is closed, not what we would usually consider a biochemical pathway, it's just simply a chemical reaction. We have this, we can formulate an equilibrium. So the path, the, the reaction is reversible. And we can write the uh, equilibrium when we have waited long enough. Uh, an equilibrium will be reached and we will get this, this equilibrium uh, concentration of A, B, C, and D. These are the concentration when the equilibrium has established itself, and we can write this uh, equilibrium constant, and the equilibrium constant is just simply, when we write it like that, the product, so product of the products, product, product of products divided by the product. So we multiply the concentrations of reactants. And if you look at textbooks, sometimes it is abbreviated with a weird sign Sometimes product is written like that. It's not an M. It's sort of just simply something like that. That's the uh, Greek capital pi. You have seen it in the uh, equation for uh, a circle. That's the lowercase pi. And the uppercase uh, pi is product. And that stands for product. It's a little bit like the symbol, the sigma symbol, That's that indicates sum, and this one here indicates product. And we are all familiar with that. If the equilibrium constant, if K equilibrium is larger than one, that's the one, Bernardo, exactly. If uh, the equilibrium uh, constant is larger than one, then we have more of this one compared to A times B, and therefore the reaction would be pretty much on the side of C and D, right? On the other hand, if our equilibrium constant is smaller than one. That means we have more of A and B compared to C and D, then the reactant, then the reaction lies on the side of the reactant, so it would be on the side. So the reaction would go in this case from right to left to establish the equilibrium. Whereas if K is larger than one, the reaction would go from left to right. And you've done that in, uh, in, in secondary school, so I'm pretty sure you're familiar with that. Okay, now how does that relate to our pathways? We very often we'll look at reactions not when they are in equilibrium because equilibrium means there is no uh, energy gain as we just seen where A and D were supposed to be on the same level. And in biochemical terms, uh, very or usually we will not necessarily have reached equilibrium in biochemical pathways. So it's very rare that we actually go to... It's cut off. What's cut off?
Have I, have I done something stupid? What? Observe. Ah, sorry. Good. Sorry. So, instead of working with equilibria in biochemical pathways, um, we are working with mass action ratio. And I've asked you to look at that uh, in, in advance. So what we do is we actually, for the mass action ratio, which is usually abbreviated with Q, we are looking at, at the concentrations of the reaction. And again, we've got the reaction A plus B to C plus D. We look at the concentrations at whatever time point we want. It doesn't have to be the equilibrium. So this is the general uh, equation. And this OPS means just the observed, the actual concentrations of these substances. So that's the observed concentrations. The, these are the observed concentrations. Now, if we are working with uh, an equilibrium, with a chemical equilibrium or with something like that, then we would it would be very difficult actually to observe these concentrations because uh, they change constantly. The chemical reaction like this one here would always very quickly get to the equi equilibrium and therefore it would be difficult to take a snapshot of the concentrations of C, D, A and B because everything happens so fast. But in a biochemical pathway where we have something like that, we actually can observe the different concentrations because we can keep these things constant because concentrations are, are constant. When we have this steady state. And the steady state we said influx equals outflux. Right? If we have that in a steady state, then we actually can observe these concentrations and we can calculate this mass action ratio Q. Okay? Something that we would be hard pressed to do if we just looked at a single reaction like this A plus B as C to D, here it would be very difficult to get a mass action ratio, whereas in a steady state, we can very easily determine it, um, just simply because the concentrations are more or less constant. Now very, so, or, or quite frequently, you will find what is called the displacement factor that tells us basically how far away an observed concentrations are from the equilibrium concentrations. And this uh, displacement factor that is uh, another Greek letter, that's the letter rho, which looks a little bit like uh, a shortened P. Uh, and it just, as I said, it means how far away is the observed concentrations that we find through Q, through Q for, away from the equilibrium. And as you can see, if, if this rho equals one, then the concentrations are identical to the equilibrium concentrations. 
And this then actually means that the reaction has reached its equilibrium. And we will discuss that uh, when we go into the details of some uh, metabolic uh, pathways. I just want to mention it here. So what we have said earlier with these little box diagrams is that a reaction will only move in the direction in which this free energy, this delta G is released. So that delta G is negative. And you encounter that as free energy, or it's also referred to as free Gibbs energy. Although I've heard that the uh, people who decide on the nomenclature of things, uh, they don't want this mention of Gibbs anymore, but uh, that's actually why it is called Delta G because of this G uh, in, in the, from the name of the person who has defined that. So if we have Delta G is smaller than zero for this reaction, then the reaction will proceed towards this direction. Or we can also say the equilibrium constant for that would be larger than one. If we go like that. If delta G is larger than zero, as we've seen before, then the reaction would go in exactly the opposite direction. Uh, or we can also write this that has the equilibrium constant smaller than one. So you see, if delta G is larger than zero, the equilibrium constant is smaller than one and the other way around. And if delta G equals zero, then the reaction will stay put and there's no change in the concentrations of the, of the compounds. If the reaction just simply has reached its equilibrium concentrations and there is no movement. Now, of course, we need to standardize these things a little bit and therefore people have decided that we can look at these reactions under standard conditions. And these standard conditions mean that all the compounds, so A, B, C, and D, these are have the starting concentration, have starting concentration, concentrations of one molar. So we mix them together, one molar, everything, and the standard conditions are also 25 degrees centigrade and one uh, atmosphere pressure. These are the standard conditions. And we can look up the values for delta G in uh, lots of tables. We can also relate this delta G, and this is uh, the delta G under standard conditions conditions is abbreviated as delta G naught prime. That indicates that this is the that is the free energy of the reaction. If we have starting concentrations of one molar, 25 degrees, and one atmosphere. And we can relate that delta G naught prime to the equilibrium constant because we said earlier here that there is this link. If delta G is smaller than zero, then the equilibrium constant is larger than one. And we can actually put this in an equation this is this famous equation here, delta G naught prime equals negative RT ln uh, K for the equilibrium constant. And here R is the universal gas constant. So 8.315 joule per mole and Kelvin. T is the temperature and that is in degrees Kelvin. And degrees Kelvin 
And if you want to convert that into degrees centigrade, you add 273 to it because 273, uh, negative 273, that's the absolute zero in degrees centigrade. And that indicates also zero uh, degrees uh, Kelvin. So if you want to convert, say, 25 degrees centigrade, into Kelvin, this would be 273 plus 25 equals 298 Kelvin. And L is the natural logarithm. And if we have these standard conditions, then our delta G, that would be just simply this delta G node prime. And we can look up this delta G for loads and loads of uh, reactions. Um, people have measured that, have calculated that, and you can find that in tables. Uh, you don't have to learn it by heart, only a few, uh, but I will uh, highlight that, uh, which one you need to be familiar with. However, Working with standard conditions is great, but not always do we actually have standard conditions. We never have concentrations of one molar of a substance in the cell. It's not that, that, that just simply doesn't happen, right? So what do we do if we have non-standard conditions? So under non-standard conditions, the compounds really start at different at various concentrations, and they are not one molar. Uh, so we need to take that into account if we want to calculate delta G, and we can do that with this equation here. Delta G equals this standard conditions delta G plus RT times LN Q, and this Q was our mass action ratio. That's the mass action ratio again that we had, where we can actually observe the reactions. And as I said here, this, this term, this RT, LNQ, takes into account that uh, the reactions are different from the standard conditions. And what we can do is we can put these equations together and say delta G is actually this delta G naught plus plus this RT, L, and Q, as I've written here, we can also substitute this delta G node prime with what we have done before up here. Delta G equals minus RT, L, and K. So we substitute it here, in this case, plus RT, L, and Q. Or, under the rules of logarithm, we can also write this RT ln Q over the equilibrium constant, or we can even write this in the short form with this displacement factor. So we can write delta G equals RT ln this squiggle row. And this tells us if the reaction is far away from the equilibrium, if the steady state is far away from an equilibrium, then the reaction can produce energy. Oof. Lots of stuff to think about. Let's do a practical example. Let's say we have the reaction ATP, the hydrolysis of ATP. ATP plus water gives ADP and inorganic phosphate. And under standard conditions, this reaction would give us a delta G node prime of negative 35 kilojoule per mole. So big question for you. In which direction does this reaction actually go? Does it go towards 
ADP and phosphate, or does it go towards ATP and water? What do you think? ADP plus phosphate or ATP plus water? We've got a negative 35 kilojoules. Is Anna right? Yes. Yes, absolutely right. It goes into ADP plus phosphate and it delivers us negative 35 kilojoules, which is a lot of energy, right? So that is for just simply looking at this reaction, at this chemical reaction. I like that. I love Joey. In an E. coli cell, however, under aerobic conditions at 37 degrees, we can measure the concentrations of, of all these compounds here. And I found a nice paper. So under steady state conditions in an E. coli cell, we find these concentrations. So what we can do now is we can use our equation that we used earlier or that I just showed you. So that would be this equation here. And we can try and figure out how much energy actually can be delivered in an E. coli cell. Yes, it is, absolutely. Uh, this is just a simplified version, uh, just playing around a little bit. So what we can do is we can plug in these numbers that we get here and calculate our Q, our mass action ratio. And I've done that and I hopefully I've done that correct. One thing that we need to be aware is the concentration of water is in molar, whereas all the other concentrations are in millimolar. But if you do it properly, you find this Q to be 6.17 uh, times 10 to the minus 5. And we now can plug this in. And I've done the calculation here. And again, you can look at it then uh, later uh, when I put the slides up. And we get a result of delta G in this case, delta G, right? That is the energy that the system can perform is now at negative 60 kilojoule per mole. So under standard conditions, it was at negative 35. But in the cell, because the concentrations of the substance are different from the standard concentrations, now the energy is even higher. It's negative 60 kilojoule per mole. And this is a very common exam question. What is the uh, delta G of the hydrolysis of ATP hydrolysis? Hydrolysis in the cell. What is the delta G of ATP hydrolysis in the cell? Delta G node prime is negative 35 kilojoule, but because we've got different concentrations of these compounds in the cell, the ATP hydrolysis actually is between delta G is uh, between negative 50 kilojoule per mole and uh, negative 70 kilojoule per mole. So much more than we would get from the uh, reaction under standard conditions. Okay, here's another one. In the reaction A plus B, C to D, delta G naught is plus 7.5 kilojoule per mole, right? On which side would this be? Would this be on A plus B or would it be on C plus D? On A plus B or C plus D? If we look at it like that.
You totally nailed it. Yes, it would be on this side. Now, in a resting muscle cell, for example, the steady state concentrations were determined with this one. On which side does the reaction lie? And how much energy can be obtained now? We can do exactly the same calculation. And with these concentrations, we get a delta G of positive 1.8. So in this case, the reaction is still endergonic and still lies off the side of the reactants here. Right? So the reaction would not move towards C plus D. The reaction would rather go from C plus D to A plus B because we've got a positive sign here. Okay, one more slide. Now we've got exactly the same reaction as before. The only difference is that now our concentration of D is 10 micromolar, whereas before it was one millimolar. But everything else is exactly the same. 10 micromolar. So we have A plus B, C plus D. And we can even write it like that. And now we change the concentration of D. Only D has changed. Our delta G naught plus was uh, what was that? 7.5 kilojoule per mole, positive. And now we can calculate our mass action ratio, but now with this 10 micromolar or 0 0.01 millimolar that we have here. And look what we get. Our delta G is now negative 9.7 kilojoule per mole. In which direction are we are now going? A to B, A plus B, or C plus D? Absolutely right. Now we are moving in the direction of C plus D. So we are moving that way. Before, we moved that way. Now we are moving in exactly the opposite direction. And all we have done is we reduced, we lowered this concentration. And this is actually the secret of any metabolic pathway. So if we've got A to B to C to D, something like that, if we've got a reaction like this. And it would sort of then go up. The reaction would not happen because delta G it, in this case, would be larger than zero. So the reaction would not happen. The reaction would go in this case, in, in this direction. But all we need to do is lower the concentration of E, lower concentration. So we move this concentration down here. Just by lowering the concentration. And all of a sudden, the reaction goes in this direction. Is there a textbook? I think you find it in most biochemical textbooks like Leninger or something like that. Um, I have just uh, sort of touched on the very basics of that. You probably need to re-watch this session, uh, maybe 
one more time or something like that. But I will put up the slides on the class uh, material uh, section on Teams. And uh, what you now have, you have now actually the tools to complete the last, the last task of the assessed of the assessed practical because this asks you i think this is is this task i think task three task three yes i think this is task three uh last task of the assessed practical in bi301 where you measure the concentrations of compounds you are given uh, a delta g naught prime and from that, you need then to calculate delta G. And there is a tutorial for uh, task one and two that is on the website. And I think there's also something about calculating the delta G. But if you refer to basically something like that, you should not have any problems. Well, enjoy the combined equation. Let me go back to that. Yeah, that's the combined equation. And sometimes it really depends on what you've been given. The most popular one is probably delta G equals delta G naught prime plus R T L N Q. And you have now all the knowledge and the tools to successfully complete practical uh, the, the assess practical for BI301 and the deadline, I would like all the submissions in by the 16th of March. So you've got plenty of time to look at that stuff and enjoy it. Next week is enhancement week. And um, in the enhancement week, I'm planning to do a session on uh, drug discovery on the Wednesday, uh, but I'm not going to do anything uh, or, or in the session on Friday. So the session on Friday is not happening. That's not a timetable session. And the time and the uh, session on Wednesday is also not timetabled. It is just optional at the usual time, uh, 11 to 12, where I show you something that will not be asked in an assessment or something like that, but I thought it might be interesting. And since we've discussed inhibitors, you might find that interesting. That is basically what the pharmaceutical industry does all the time, try to figure out uh, inhibitors for enzymes. And that is the basis of all drug discovery. Uh, no, I have not yet set the deadline for the BI308. So don't worry about it. I will tell you exactly when this has to be in. But BI301 for the enzymes, please, 16th of March. Thank you very much. Have a lovely weekend and uh, do the program level multiple choice test. Enjoy. Have fun. Take care. Bye-bye. Be good. Don't do anything I wouldn't do.